This is important. All right. So today we're going to cover Karl Marx. And then once we get straight what Marx said, I want you to think about in your country, did you have a Marxist revolution or not, right? Do you have people in your country who are Marxists? And are they Marxists because the history of your country is the history of capitalists exploiting your natural resources and your human resources, right? You can, they get people to work in factories in your countries, but they're the ones in charge of salaries and working conditions. And all the political rulers are basically puppets and defenders of capitalists, right? So you could say, is that what's going on? Facts on the ground. Companies are coming in. And actually, I mean, it could be China, could be America, it could be Europe, whatever. Could be Russia, I don't know. Are they coming in? Are they exploiting your resources? Are they underpaying employees? Are, you know, these things. It's all about money. Have, has capitalism changed the conditions of production in your country? Has your country gone from primarily most of its wealth from agriculture and farming to primarily its wealth coming from factories or technology or something you know new? How has that changed all the other relationships in your country? So are women treated more equally? Is that, if so, is that because everyone's suddenly enlightened or is it because of money? So sexist fathers or sexist husbands might still dominate their wives or their daughters, but they also want them to get an education because they know their daughters can make as much money as a guy because now it's a matter of brain power. It's not a matter of upper body strength. And also science and technology enables birth control and it enables people to stay healthy. So it used to be that most people spent most of their energy simply having kids and hoping a few of them lived to bury their parents. But now because of science and technology, um, we spend relatively a lot less energy over a lifetime in the tasks related to creating the next generation and raising them to adulthood. So, um, so I want you to just brainstorm about what has gone on in your country. And then you think about how do people think about what's going on in their country? That's an entirely different thing, right? And you need to know that culture superimposes itself on facts, right? Culture is this desire to find patterns in the facts, to make meaning out of the facts. So, so you want to think about how many people, yes, um, so how many people in your country are um, interpret what's going on in your country through a Marxist lens and they want, well, and then what do they want? They might want a revolution. They might want uh, working people to um, take over, but most of them, I would guess they understand that capitalism is the force behind this, but they have different ideas of how to solve the problem. So that's an open question. How many people in your country basically think in terms of John Locke rights? I have a right to do with my property whatever I want, keep the government out of it. I can make contracts with corporations, Chinese, Western, whatever I want. 
and the government can't tell me that I can't pollute or that I that deforestation is important. It's my business. I don't know, right? Are there some people with that attitude in your country? Um, what sort of worldview do your politicians sort of superimpose, try to teach the people to accept? What do, how do they want the people to interpret what's going on? Um, how much does um, Kantian kind of dualism play a role? Like it's the principle of the thing. The principle of the thing is that we should use our reason for human well-being, and we can use the rest of the natural world, right? Plants, animals, whatever it takes, because human beings have infinite worth, right? How much, how many people in your country actually, they don't read Kant, they have no idea, but they think like Kant, right? And then how many people that are engineers, right? They have big, they have sophisticated degrees, but the way they think is dualistic. And so arguments about the ecosystem, by arguments based on biology are not very compelling to them because they think in this other way. And then how many people in your country are utilitarians? They basically think, well, happiness means we can get more people fed, right? So all of this development from corporations is, is raising people into the middle class from poverty. And that's happiness and that's utility. So we should keep doing it. Um, so I, I really want you to sort that out in your head. Um, obviously you can't do that in two days or something, but I want you to think about in your past you've read articles or you've gotten in discussion groups or you have uh, other classes that talk about this. So you've already thought about it to some extent, but to what extent does ever since your countries have started opening up to capitalist development, what has changed? How have the relationships of production changed at just exactly the way Marx understands it. So um, that's what we're gonna do today. And then your paper that's due later in the week is your final take on what do you think the legacy of Western science and technology exploiting nature? What do you think um, is what you inherited? What did you inherit from that hundred many a uh, number of centuries tradition and what do you see going forward because there are going to be radical changes right every the, the weather is going to change radically and so people's ideas are going to have to change and you can anticipate worst case scenario is that people don't change their behavior they just find someone to blame, right? Ah, um, and that's not going to work because a strong man will come in there and yeah, it's all their fault, you know, vote for me and I'll kill those Americans for you. And it doesn't work. All he does is help himself and his friends protect them from climate change, but nobody else. Um, so, I, I want you to ponder this, but the paper this weekend is just a thousand words. Um, so it's just the beginning of thinking about it. And I want you to begin to think about it because you will think about it the rest of your life. You won't be able to avoid it. I think what this class contributes is it gives you a context, an important context of what actually happened and how people thought about what happened. And so as a leader, once you have a, a college degree, you have to lead, you have to lead both culturally and also materially, right? You have to think about 
what sort of legacy do you want to pass on, both in terms of your carbon footprint, like how you live your life, and what what uh, your professional life, but also just your cultural life, like when you're talking to family, when you're talking to friends, when you're engaged in any kind of public discourse, what do you want your voice to be, right? What do you want to say when people start talking about this? Because no one's gonna be able to avoid it um, anymore. I, in my country, people avoided it for far too long and they still are avoiding it but that's not gonna last either. Um, this week in Minnesota, there is a record breaking heat wave, um, just huge record breaking, right? The temperature yesterday was seven degrees above what it has ever been before on record, right? It's not just a little bit, it's and 70% of the farmland is in a pre-drought situation, right? I mean, even in Minnesota, it which isn't like Miami that's getting, you know, the water levels going up and so people's houses are flooding, seems a little bit obvious. Or the places where the hurricanes are or California where the fires are, right? Even in Minnesota that has a lot of water, um, yeah, so I don't know how much longer Americans are going to be able to deny this, but they will. <laughs> I, it, but the question is, people in your countries, I, I don't think even the common person. So in Indonesia, for example, there were two um, islands that were going to be, what is it, when everybody has to move off because of climate change. <laughs> So no, you know, even a kid from a small village in Indonesia doesn't deny climate change. Um, so my, my thought is that politicians can't get points for denying climate change. So they all run to the UN and they sign the Paris Accord and they present themselves as really concerned about it. And some of them really are and some of them really aren't. But the next step is how much power do they have to do anything about it? And can Westerners expect them to say no when the, the forestry industry comes in and offers jobs? Um, so that's kind of where we're at. Um, so I hope everybody's come with some reactions to Karl Marx. But what I'm going to do, just to trigger your memory, or for those of you who aren't prepared, you must think of something related to what I say. And then when I stop talking, depending upon what time it is, everybody remind me we have a break, okay? Because that's the plan, one hour talk. 10 minute break, right? So don't let me break my uh, promise, my contract to you. All right. Um, okay, so here's what I had on the post. Um, so last time, okay, let me just, I did read a couple posts and it is nicer when the students will post um, at, at the appropriate time, because then I can bring that in when I'm talking. Uh, I, I have caught up on all the posts because there aren't that many. So lots of students are falling behind and um, I would advise you against it, but I know that your lives are busy all I know is I give you about 15 pages to read. If for a week and a half, that's not very much. So I'm not gonna lower my expectations, but I will be patient about deadlines. Um, all right. So, um, okay. 
when, when I read about utilitarianism in the small groups, I really think your small group should not be reinforcing your unexamined life, right? Everything you say in small group should be, well, I used to think this, but now all of a sudden that I'm having to reconsider that. So on utilitarianism, it was like, well, some people like going to church and some people like shopping and some people like this and that. So happiness is relative and pleasures are relative. Okay, what I would want you to think about, every time you go shopping, every time you associate happiness with shopping, which, when, what I mean by shopping is you didn't have to go there, right? Um, I guess when you go to the grocery store because there's no food in the house, right? And you buy healthy food or clothing, but it, if you're just shopping, because you like to buy things you don't need or you like to window shop. And, and clearly there are many huge malls in developing countries, so a lot of people do. To what extent have you been brainwashed by Westerners who are making money off of you and who are going, you are going to suffer from the climate change that results from all this unnecessary fossil fuel emissions. You know, you should, you should think about that, right? I used to, you know, when I was a teenager, that's what made me happy, but I think I want to change what makes me happy. Um, because if you associate that with this exploitation, it shouldn't make you happy anymore, right? Something else should make you happy, which is to stay away from that. Um, so I do want you to reconsider based on your education. That's one thing I want you to think about. Um, all right, so here, here we're at. And then the last thing, the last hour or 45 minutes, I will talk about Christianity. Uh, and we will move, we're going to move from the section of the class on the Western Enlightenment science application to religion, okay? And the religious traditions and religious um, implications, right? Religions and the environment. Now, Marx said that religion is just the opiate of the people, right? That politicians use religion to appease people. Just tell them that's okay if you're suffering in this world. If you just suffer graciously, you'll have heaven, right? You'll have an eternity of wealth and pleasure and happiness. So they just use religion or they can use it as a weapon to gain power, right? Uh, if you vote for me, I'll go after those so-and-sos, whatever other religion because their God is a false God, blah, blah. So Karl Marx would, uh, was an atheist, right? So first you write your essay on the impact of what we've read, then we'll do religion, right? And then overall in your head, you should be able to get straight, was Marx right about religion or is there a real difference between the actual principles of the religions and the way politicians abuse those religions, right? So, so that moving forward, you can decide, am I gonna be an atheist humanist? Because I just think any kind of religion is naturally corrupted and leads to not caring enough about the environment? Or am I going to be a true Hindu or true Christian or a true Muslim who any, anyone who studies the values will say humility is important, greed is bad, you know, that the real values of the tradition would fit right in with environment. So that, but that's a different issue. That's the next section of the class. So let's go back to Marx here. Um, let's see. 
No. Yeah, this one. All right. So let me go. Here was the reading, the short reading. The history of all society has been a class struggle, right? All it is has been in the past is about money. Um, and then he says, okay, in my time, which was what, 19th century, it's all become so obvious that that's true, that factory work, so the replacement of agriculture with industry, factory work, has made, has reduced all class relationships to just the worker and the owner. That's it, all over the world. And so ever it's it's become blatant. And he says America, the discovery of America paved the way. Now I want you to go back and remember John Locke. Do you remember his view of property? That if I work the land, I have a right to the fruit of my labor, as opposed to in Europe where people inherited their estates, right? So America led the way in destroying the environment to create wealth. And America led the way in progressive, um, you know, science-based, uh, so America was the most progressive and it went the fastest forward because it didn't have all those class um, privileges that sort of kept countries stuck in their old molds because the people on top didn't want to change. So America was all about change and progress. Oh my God, America was, you know, we're the city on the hill, we're God's messenger, we're showing everybody how to do it. So um, if, if you remember, Locke talked about the right to the fruit of your labor, but he also wanted a barter economy, right? So he didn't want money to get invented because then he thought, oh my gosh, money will stick to money and it will be this huge problem. Then if you remember Adam Smith, he wanted to get rid of the economic system run by the rich that would have tariffs on imports to favor the rich so that nothing had to change. So he advocated a free market, just let everybody trade and we'll get the best product at the lowest price. But Adam Smith said, teach children not to be greedy or else the system is not gonna work. Well, what happened? Eh. <laughs> Money was invented. There was this huge expansion, right? Just unlimited. So free market meant no holes barred, keep the government out and I can get as rich as I want because the richer I get, the more jobs I can give um, and the more of the natural world I can exploit. Okay, so I hope you understand based on what we've read why he says America paved the way. Um, let's see. The executive, the modern state, the political leaders are just a committee to manage the affairs of the rich, right? So rich people pay for the campaigns, get their guys elected. They're, they have all these lobbyists, right? So the politicians, the rich folk and the, the corporate lobbyists come in there, meet with the politicians and tell them, you know, we need you to make a law that says uh, solar panels need to be taxed because we're fossil fuel country co companies and we need to make more money and we paid for your campaign. So you tax solar panels for us, right? And it's just that whole thing is that they are puppets to whoever has control of the economic system and they help them manage their affairs, right? Okay, so the big criminals are just, um, are black people in the ghetto, just 
get working people to blame those people. So you pit working people against the underclass, it's all their mm -hmm. fault, or the capitalists um, bring in undocumented workers, but then they let the politicians, they literally are hiring undocumented workers and telling the politicians to demonize these workers in order to get votes, right? You do whatever we say, and this is how we're gonna win the election and get another politician to do our bidding. So that's what he's talking about. I don't know how much uh, lobbying plays a role in your country. Do corporations from China, America, Europe, do they have lobbyists that come in and talk to your political leaders and tell them, you know, what laws to make? Um, I, I am eager to learn these things. Um, and here's the key, freedom. Remember, Locke said, we have a right to life, liberty, health, and possessions, <laughs> stuff, okay, and maximize freedom. The only purpose of government is military and police. And capitalists want a good military and a good police force to keep their, keep the country, keep people afraid of challenging anything. And also military to engage in expansion for the sake of money. Um, in our case, the last Iraq war was clearly driven by money. The people behind that war had a whole plan for how to have cheap oil. It's all on paper. But that's why I would think there's still a lot of Marxists around because of the force of capitalism. It hasn't really let up at all. Um, whoa, what did I do? Um, I punched the wrong button. Okay, so all of a sudden personal worth is just how much money you make. And he's talking about all those other freedoms, right? That Locke talked about or Adam Smith talked about. It's really just about free trade, just about money. Um, religious beliefs, um, the political illusions about democracy. There, it, it's, it's all just about money. Uh, let's see. The bourgeoisie has to constantly revolutionize. And so you know how this works, right? You get uh, a new Apple phone and everybody's on board to pay whatever, 800 bucks or whatever. But everybody's you know, eager to get the next best thing. And so that's the only way they can keep increasing their markets is keep trying to convince uh, consumers that they absolutely are going to die if they don't get the most recent thing. Um, let's see. I so I hope you can you know understand how many of your friends are obsessed about getting you know the next best product, which just means they've gotten totally uh, brainwashed by this system. Um, Let's see, old industries are changed. Oh, intellectual ideas, right? Um, so people like me, <laughs> you know, all these intellectuals are going all over the world and talking about, you know, Aristotle's virtues are universal, but really Aristotle was used as a tool for colonialism and it justified capitalist exploitation and blah, blah. So how much of all this internationalism is really just about money, just about getting AUW students to think globally and act uh, capitalistically, right? Uh, do whatever the capitalists want because um, in the big corporations, if you wanna move up, you're gonna be working with people from different countries and different religions and different ethnicities, but you know, so in order for us to make money, we have to have these college professors teaching students that, oh, really, all the religions have the same values. And so you can get along with your, your corporate 
colleagues, right? So that's what he'd say, is that I'm a puppet just like everybody else. And I definitely have thought about it. I mean, I all I want you to do is think about it. Don't let any anything offend you, you know, that somebody would say, I'm a puppet, you know, don't be defensive about it. Just go, huh, maybe that's true. Like, you're too young to get defensive. In college, you should just blow your mind, right? Oh, maybe I am this, or maybe I am that, you know? And give yourself a chance to rethink everything, because once you get out in the real world, you're gonna have to just function and you can't keep undermining yourself all the time. Um, let's see, cheap prices, of course. Um, everybody wants things cheaper and that's why people like Ivanka Trump, right? She has some shoes, you know, oh my God. The idea of the Trump brand, it's so irrational. It just drives me nuts. Like, why do you pay all that more money? It's the same stupid purse, you know, or the same stupid lipstick or whatever. But I read somewhere that lipstick costs four cents to make a $4 lipstick, you know? That's crazy. Whatever the markets, you know, as long as you can have advertising, you will die if you don't have this lipstick. They can sell it for 400 times what they pay. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so Ivanka Trump was, she moved one of her companies to Ethiopia, her shoe company, because that was absolutely the cheapest place in the world. And so you can exploit people in Ethiopia more than you can exploit them in Bangladesh. So I'm taking my company. You know, it's a, it's a spiral to the bottom. It's a race to the bottom. And she, she could not care less if what she's doing is lowering the standard of living of workers in the US down to the level of Ethiopia or something. I mean, they just absolutely do not think of the overall consequences of this. Or if you wanna think about utility, they think the, con you know, they're thinking of the consequences, they'll make more money and of course, having capitalists make money is great because it'll all trickle down. It doesn't trickle down. That's where somebody, people really disagree when they're calculating overall happiness, pleasure, and pain, when they're calculating how the economic system works. And so um, that view that if you just let capitalist entrepreneurs, if you let it free trade, free market, like Adam Smith said, everything will work out great. But that's that's been corrupted with the further belief that greed should motivate that rather than Adam Smith, not greed, anything but greed. Um, so this process of urbanization, I think by 2030 or something, I can't remember if it's 2030, 2050, 68% of the world's population will live in the city. Um, let's see. Um, so he thinks we've gotten to this point like where we have too many people and, too, and we have overproduction, which is true. We have robots, so we don't have enough jobs for people. So the next wave is, should everyone have a guaranteed income? And so one of the Democratic Party's candidates, Andrew Yang, I think his name was, he's, he sort of planted that seed. Like, should we have a guaranteed income? So that would be much more government intervention in the free market to tax everyone so that everyone would get some income because we have overproduction. Our machines are too efficient and um, there's too many people and there's no jobs. Um, and just cutting taxes for the rich doesn't work because just to give you one tiny example, okay, Walmart got its taxes cut and they put in all self-serving self, self -serving, cash cash at the end, you know, 
checking out so that all the checkout people lost their jobs <laughs> after Walmart got their taxes cut. So that's just, that's the way it works, right? Um, Walmart controlled the legislature and told them cut taxes and, and the puppets did it. And then more people lost their jobs. So Marx is anticipating this problem the epidemic of overproduction. Um, there's too much civilization, too much means of subsistence, too much industry, too much commerce. Um, and how do they get over it? By even more, right? More intense, go to even more countries, go international, exploit more resources. They, they can't stop. They're, this is the only method they know and so that's why he wants a revolution with an entirely different relationship between the producer and the consumer. Um, let's see. So his idea of the solution, abolish private property, have the government run every, um, sell, sell every product. Now, most people know that this didn't work out too well um, and so each of you, I hope, has a story about your country and how communism, did it work, didn't it work, was it tried, was, did the leaders use communist rhetoric uh, to gain power? But, but Marx thought that you could have this huge centralization of power because the two power sources are the political system and the economic system. And they need to be balanced out, right? They're constantly, um, they, at best, you can have regulated capitalism and things can be reasonable, but at worst, they're collapsed into one. And then Marx did not think that would be a problem. He thought people would be reasonable and they would not never want to oppress anybody else because they'd been oppressed. And so um, power would just fade away and people would get along and they would trade, trade off jobs. And uh, yeah. And of course that was horrifying. Um, let's see. They wanted public education. They want to abolish the family because the family is just a, uh, economic, a way to protect your wealth and pass it on. It's a way to keep the rich richer and the poor poorer. Um, they want to abolish nationalities, abolish religion, because all those things are just ways to concentrate power. Um, okay, so let me just put you into groups now and you think about has communists had, you know, all this stuff in relationship to your country? Or if you want to just talk about, is it compelling to you in general, the position, then give the reasons why you do agree or you don't agree. And then would Mark say that you've been brainwashed by capitalism? Go ahead, you know, <laughs> just ask yourself, ooh, would Karl Marx like the way I think or feel or act? Um, and uh, do I think he's right about that or not? So Arifa, go ahead. Any sort of reaction to Karl Marx's critique of capitalism or his idea of the solution? What have you got? Okay, Sauda. Uh, yes, Professor. So, like, for me, when like when I'm when I was reading mostly, so I just said this in uh, the group uh, record room as well. 
for uh, me personally, like our in our country, like in our generation, even my yeah, the previous generation, if I look at like my parents and everything, uh, the we all kind of grew up with the democratic uh, rule and like our point of view and everything is kind of like quite influenced by that. I don't think like the uh, communism isn't like very popular here. So it's, uh, a, and it hasn't been historically, it, it hasn't been like practiced either. So I would say the like view point that we have and the, our parents have, the previous generations have, it's quite like similar, even though uh, we right now it's kind of more expanding. So we all are thinking like an, in a point of view. So if what, yeah, I was, I was thinking, so okay, the, these two things. So obviously we have like uh, the, uh, Think about like individualism and our rights, economical rights and everything. We do have that, but like also in context of our, our culture, we have, we also, we are like very family based. So even though we, we are like communism isn't like popular here, like the viewpoint of like us and communal uh, happiness or well being is like kind of ingrained in our con culture, even though we are like going towards a lot in, like we're a lot influenced by the West and like the individualism and like me, me thing. Uh, and then even though that's like, we're influenced by that, but also the, the notion of like communal well-being, it's kind of embedded in our culture. So, it's a kind of a mix of both, but I uh, right now I think like day by day, it's kind of going away a lot. And like for example, like even uh, fifty years ago, like we wouldn't imagine having an old home or like parents or grandparents living uh, like separate from their family, so it wasn't a thing at all but right now it's kind of becoming like very common thing it's not something unimaginable it's happening it's here it's like very common so uh, the society or like every generation is progressing towards very like individual uh, happiness and everything so like in that sense like we are very we're getting influenced by like the Western viewpoint and Western values. So things are changing. What country I would, is this? Uh, Bangladesh. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Do you think, what would Mark think of the, would Mark think that Bangladeshis think they care about democracy, but actually the people who promote it are do it so that capitalists will come into Bangladesh and um, develop the country and give them a good name. So underneath it all, it's really about capitalist development. Uh, I think so, yeah, because like everyone is, it is like capitalistic completely because everyone is, uh, has that value everyone wants that cap capitalistic society here so no one is all about on like individual profits and everything if we didn't have that i think like development and everything like we wouldn't still be a developing country we would uh like progress further a lot quicker if we didn't have that influence from outside and then like the, so the uh, mindsets of people changed here. Right. Yeah. I, I do think um, on the one hand, Bangladesh was so poor that 
having anybody come in from the outside and help them out was yes. good, right? But on the other hand, they're one of the top three countries in the world for being affected by climate change. And so they should be very critical of what capitalism is doing, right? And the fossil fuel emissions. So it seems like they're really conflicted. Um, does that make sense? Uh, yes. So in the grand scheme of thing, if we look at it, we should be like very angry with everyone and, you know, be critical of everything. But I don't think we have that power to do so because we are very dependent on like outside resources right. and like investment from other countries and help. So if we are being really critical and, you know, trying to, you know, blame everybody rightfully so or not, but like it, right. would, it, it might like hamper that relationship and it would like the sufferings would be on our end mostly. Yeah, it's just really hard. Bangladesh is particularly poor and particularly influenced negatively by the by the fossil fuel economy, right? Um, yeah. in, in your lifetime though, in your lifetime, Bangladesh will have some kind of radical change because, you know, it can't go on like this, uh, having, you know, half the country underwater most of the time or all the cyclones. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, it sounds like at the moment, people are more fixated on uh, individual, the lock point of view, right? Individual yeah. rights, democracy, and with it, capitalism, as Karl Marx says. Um, and they're not yet, they haven't yet decided, whoops, there's a high price, right? Um, so we'll see, we'll see what happens over time. Um, Shamima, what have you got? Okay. Okay. So, let me know in the chat if you don't, you aren't connected, or if you just have nothing to say, because I do need to know that. Um, Ramisha. Yes, Professor. Uh, so, uh, basically, uh, Sri Lanka is a, a developing economy uh, based largely on uh, agriculture services and light industry. So these things I think uh, bring uh, lots of uh, jobs to people. So nowadays uh, what is uh, going on in my country is that uh, China is uh, constructing a port city in my country. So like uh, it, it still it's uh, people think that uh, it's a controversial to people because uh, some people think that uh, it uh, like the government says that uh, it brings lots of jobs to people so people can work in that port city. However, the uh, like we don't know the impact, what will be the impact on the environment in the future. So, yeah. Okay, good, very good. Um, so, I will tell you that. The future, what's going to happen is the US and China are going to have this huge competition for who gets the best green technology, right? Who gets to sell green technology, the highest quality at the lowest price? I mean, at the moment, it's really hard for me to believe that they haven't radically changed already, but they will. And then, uh, yeah, the Biden administration is just saying, we got to get ahead of China. They're going to, you know, eat us for lunch. But the Republicans are still controlled by fossil fuel billionaires and they still deny it. It's really incredible. But that is what's going to happen. So keep an eye out, folks. You're going to be playing, you know, your players in the game, whether you want to be or not. Um, so it is good to be informed about that. Um, Mosa, what have you got? 
And Professor, I do agree the previous speaker, for example, can you hear me? I'm audible. Yes, I can hear you. So yeah. according to Carl's perspective, uh, like it's more about communism and it is mainly uh, like um, common in uh, European countries. But Bangladesh is, a, you know, in my um, uh, like community or culture, it's mostly under democratic country. But Professor, like it also in Bangladeshi culture is day by day also uh, influence the capitalism because uh, these people getting richer and the people who are poor is getting poor. But uh, it's also in you know it's underdeveloped country we could say, but we could find a lot of people who are very rich. Even uh, the, the, the GDP is very very high, but compared to other people, who, uh, is for example people who based on agriculture, their life is very poor. The remaining poor and other people who are investing in the capitalism, like uh, for example, they are uh, from for example, like investing from other countries and then they're getting a lot of money. But other workers who work on who are, who are people working under theirs, under them, they're not you know making so much money to live their life. So it makes people, you know, a professor like I'm not agree to them, I'm not not agreeing completely because. Uh, in Bangladeshi perspective, uh, it's not common, but day by day is completely changing, Professor. It's just having influence on, on capitalism. What What is having influence? Uh, for example, like uh, Carl's perspective, like communism is very common in European countries, right? But Bangladesh is under democratic country according to right. the constitution. But the thing is that it's day by day is changing because people are, uh, like according to like you know democratic counting every people should have their rights to live right and to live their happy life but day by day people you know um like you know they are more uh focusing their own life on individual happiness okay. so that's why that's the thing professor that makes me so you know um you could say um, i don't know what to say but, I know you know, it's yeah, sometimes that's my my mind a bit lost. Uh, actually, I mean, there were some Marxist parties, right, in Bangladesh during the independence movement. Yes. Yes. Okay. And then the other parties would score points politically by demonizing that party, right? Yes, Professor. Right. What I read was right that they're all worried that China is going to take over. That's the communist. So any, any party that that liked reading the manifesto got associated with China and blah blah. And then on the other hand, there's the parties associated with what US or India or something. So, right. so I think that as long as you understand that it's one thing to read the manifesto and say this goes on in my country, right? And it's it, right, so, yeah. It's another thing to be a puppet of China, right? So, right? It's one thing to think capitalism, you know, is increasing the gross domestic product and it's giving people jobs, except that more and more we keep having to adapt, pay our workers less, ruin our country more because the capitalists are really, you know, right. okay, so. When I was reading that history, I just thought, oh my gosh, it's all the same patterns, except that Bangladesh was just, oh my God, such a puppet in the middle of, you know, the geopolitical situation. They're just playing with countries like you play on a chessboard. It was very annoying. Um, so I, uh, anything, you know, I respect how, how well Bangladesh seems to be doing compared to my gosh the way other countries have abused them and, and all the other climate situations and things that really make it difficult for them. Uh, but anyway, that was my overall impression. So, um, Sristi, what do you think? Yes, Professor. So it was like, um, I think Bangladeshi political system and the ruling system is very confusing because, and also it's a, it's a democratic democratic country, right? But 
people are like there are only two groups when the when the election comes and the other group is always like very minor and for, since 2014 there is like only one group that's ruling bangladesh and so that's why i'm really confused about it so is there really the democracy exist like what's the situation actually i live here but i'm i'm really confused about the whole situation and uh also uh the other thing like when people were to, uh, when like the others have said and the, the locks point of view like the free will of bangladeshi people that's increasing nowadays and they are getting richer and richer because they are only thinking about the, their individualism i think that's not not just the free will but the greed and also uh their selfishness and on the neg negative side Okay, good. Um, so Rossi already spoke. Anything else you want to say, Rossi? Um, no, I just have a bit to add to Thristi. Um, Cambodia is no different from Bangladesh in terms of only having one political party ruling, like in Cambodia. The, our political leader has been in power for over 30 years. And to me, that is more like dictatorship than democracy because in every election, all the other parties running are branching off of that same one. So there's like no real opposing party to it. Okay. Okay. Um, it sounds even more extreme than Bangladesh. They have two separate yeah. who have a terrible history of their relationship, right? Um, yeah. Uh, I read about that, right? The yeah. one woman got her family, her dad and her family got mowed down by the other ones or something, right? And she was in Europe at the time or whatever. I'm terrible at names, but I just think that history of having all that blood shed between those two leaders is hard. It's hard to come out of that. Right, it's hard to work together um, in a situation with that kind of history. But um, okay, Sandini. Okay, I I would like to add something what Ramesh has said, which is similar to what Ramesh has said. So there are so many Chinese constructions going on Sri Lanka, uh, like as exam as an example, like uh, the there are so many highways as well as there is a harbor. So I think uh, the people get jobs, but uh, they get salaries, but the whole profit goes to China around five to 10 years. So that's one of the disadvantages of that. Okay, yep. The, what is that called? The Roads and Bridges Project or something? Yeah, China's- One, one Belt, One Road Initiative. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so, yep, that's gonna be, that's gonna be big. Um, and the U.S., I mean, it, it is interesting because the U.S., because we have such a minimal government, we spend all our money on military, right? And the Chinese, it's always been economic. The whole history of China has been, you know, the Silk Road. It's all been, um, they've gained power through economic means, whereas in our country, it's military. And I really think economic is the way to go. <laughs> I mean, you can't bomb your way into a, you know, a higher place on the hierarchy, but I don't know how many bombs Americans are gonna have to drop before they finally figure that out or how many wars, how many boots on the ground. Um, but it is interesting because China, you know, they'll have, they'll probably have some military and they'll, you know, act tough, but that's not really where they're going. They're going with economic development. Um, okay, Shazneen, you're also from Sri Lanka. Professor. Do you have anything else to say? Um, Professor, uh, Ramesh and Sandhani have pretty much covered most of what is going on in our country, but I would like to um, add one thing. Um, so Sri Lanka, the official name of Sri Lanka is the Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka. And, I feel like during the elections, they stress a lot on the fact like, okay, you have your voice, you have the power to choose. But then you also hear all these rumors about the ballots being, uh, you know, altered and corrupted. 
because um, so uh, this is out of my uh, personal experience. You talk to a lot of like uh, so the government, the government, the local government elections took place like while I was in Sri Lanka uh, after, during the pandemic. And, um, you know, a lot of people seem to have, you know, voted for this one party, but then this other party won by, you know, a substantial amount. Um, and like, they also counted the ballots later, like a day late because of, uh, you know, the pandemic and everything. But then a lot of people seem to think that it had been, you know, the results had been corrupted. Um, so a lot of people also refer to the current government as, you know, um, so the current president as a dictator, um, the family is very powerful. They go by the name of Rajapaksha and there are a lot of people. So um, the president is Gotar by Rajapaksha and then the prime minister is uh, Mahinda Rajapaksha. Mahinda Rajapaksha was also like a former president for eight years. And Gotar by Rajapaksha is actually a citizen of USA. So um, I think Marx would say that um, Sri Lanka is very um, capitalist because they focus a lot on like trying to, uh, you know, trying to raise the economy, but then it's all backfiring because, uh, uh, for example, the president came in order to um, build a road along the, the Singharaja forest, which is one of the only remaining primary forests in Sri Lanka. So no regard for environment whatsoever. And I think a 14 year, um, sorry, a school girl was like um, arrested by the police for speaking up against, uh, you know, the environmental damage caused by the current government. So I feel like there's no, um, there's no democracy because we don't have a voice. If you do say something against the government, there can be consequences, but they also have enough power to cover it up well. Uh, and does the government use religion as a weapon? Because I know there have been some animosity between Hindus and Muslims in Sri Lanka, right? Um, Singhal, uh, Buddhists and Muslims. Uh, yes, Professor, I think they do, they do use religion to kind of fuel this age-old feuds again. Uh, I think they're just trying to create unrest um, because, you know, it's easier to, it's easier to, uh, I don't know, exercise power when there's unrest okay. among the population. Right. Okay. So in your posts, you can write about, you know, is, first of all, is religion an opiate, a drug, right? Mm -hmm. um, do the rulers use that or is it a weapon, right? Um, the reason why I think it's probably being used more as a weapon now than as a drug is because if the rulers tell people, well, you know, just pray and just, you know, um, this is this incarnation, you'll have another incarnation or something like that, then they can't get them to work hard, right? And capitalism wants them to work hard. <laughs> so, you know, we want them to think that God or their religion wants them to be more successful, right? and think they're individuals, I mean, like John Locke, work hard and God gave us the land and all that sort of stuff. So- um, and, um, Professor, I would just like to add one more thing to what Ramesha said about Port City. I think Ramesha and Sandani both spoke, spoke about it. So uh, right now the president is releasing official statements to invite capitalists to come invest and <laughs> build on uh, Port City. Okay, good. So, um, uh, okay, so does everybody understand that Marx, I mean, there's ideas in Marx that Gorbachev said when he, you know, broke the wall down. He hasn't really given up the main principles. It's just that because there was this, uh, this another change in the means of production from factories to um, technology and it required education, all that. So he's just um, modifying the view. So it, it might make sense to say during the factory era when people could change jobs and that didn't require education, um, 
you can use religion as a drug because it just keeps people sort of not to, you know, not having a lot of initiative. Whereas in this society, you reward initiative, even though you know that some people are going to get a whole lot more than others, but everybody, you know, thinks that if they work, they'll get what they deserve. But then you use religion in this other ways. So in general, for power, religion is just a tool of powerful people to get to maintain wealth and power. So Gorbachev, like Gorbachev would say, it's the same principle. And it doesn't really refute Marx. It's just that it has a different focus at this point. Does that make sense? Why Marx was an atheist, you know? He's an atheist. Does that make sense to people? Um, Professor, I think um, in Sri Lanka, education is also a tool, but not in the way we would want it to be. So um, I think <laughs> the government tries to limit um, you know, the education of the general public okay. so that it would be easier to you know, exercise power. Because okay. I know that until so Sri Lanka was under British rule for some time. And then after we... Uh, gained our independence, I think, up to around 1950, uh, 58, 59, probably, there was still, you know, schools were still teaching English, like everything was taught in English, but then they changed it uh, to Sinhalese or Tamil. Um, and then there's this thing, so um, there's a, a Sri Lanka um, promises free education to children, but then there's a very limited, uh, you know, very limited number. And then, uh, so myself, like a lot of people had to um, go to international schools. So they're not under the government. So we had to pay for education, you know, pay a lot. And we couldn't, um, uh, we couldn't keep up with the, the national syllabus because um, personally, so I was, I was from an English background and I couldn't um, talk Sinhala. That well, I wasn't very familiar with Sinhala or Tamil. So, um, so those who go to an international school, we have this um, disadvantage that we're not able to get into, uh, we're not even allowed to apply to an, uh, local universities. Local universities are free, um, but we don't have that option. And uh, yeah, wow. I think it's a little unfair. So we are forced to uh, you know, wow. leave the country if we want to study or pay a really big amount to go to private universities. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. If anybody is interested in my other class, I had them read an article about the way education has changed in the U.S. from a public good to just a private investment, right? And how that's affecting the class system. So, yeah. And I do want to say that um, I do insist that you have good English, right? And I know that that's partly, you know, you could say that's just a uh, power grab, right? That, that it's just Westerners trying to make me, you know, into a Westerner and all that stuff. But I do it for your sake, right? I mean, I, I'm not happy about the way language and education is used as a tool to maintain the power of people. But on the other hand, none of the people in this meeting has the power to change that. And so I do think you need to play the game in terms of getting good English. And so that's why I, uh, you know, I like to read over your posts. I, tr I like to try to rewrite them and help you look at your English. Um, but I can't do it if, you know, if I start getting just piles of them. But anyway, yeah, e education is, um, is generally, that's the most disappointing to me, right? Is the way that it's used as a, as a tool. And it's in the hands, it has so much to do with class. It shouldn't really. Um, okay, who hasn't spoken yet? Because the order of the people has sort of switched around. Um, Anin, Anindita, have you spoken yet? Okay. Okay. Um, how about Raihana?
Professor, I send my point of view in your chat box because I have a low internet connection. So that's why I was thinking that if I disconnect. Oh, well, why don't you just try, right? Because of this reason, I send you my point of view in your chat box. Can you please check oh. it? Well, why don't you talk? And then if you disconnect, I'll go to it. But then everybody can hear you talking, OK? It's not. Okay. Um, okay, so it's only the appearance, but I don't know what your country is. <laughs> Wait, did I write it down? Um, uh, let's see. Yeah, I didn't write down what country are you in, Rehana? Um, oh, Afghanistan, yeah. Yes, yes. So they claim to be a democracy, all right. <laughs> of course, that's not, um, yeah, okay. So um, Afghanistan is not a real democracy. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, that's a problem. Um, so what about you, Jamie? Okay. All right. Um, all right. So um, when you, of course, when you study whether democracies work, see in the US, people are really naive, right? And they think, oh, we'll just, bomb Iraq and we'll replace it with a democracy. <laughs> well, first of all, the politicians say that because they know they can get away with it. But nobody, nobody believes that. And um, the real motive was to set up was to get cheap oil. And if you keep Iraq and these countries weak, then you then the corporations can come in there and make deals and the politicians aren't strong enough to stand up to them. So um, yeah, anyway, as long, I just want you to be able to put on those, those Marxist glasses and look at how, to the extent to which underneath all the language, it's just about money. That's what he would say. Um, and that, that, this is the this is the product. This is the end product of what started with John Locke with science. Excuse me. Um, what started with science and the applications of science and industry and technology. Now we carry that with us. Now we have that. That's the world that you inherit. So if you remember Francis Bacon, the purpose of knowledge is to gain power. Um, and he's unapologetic, oh boy. He doesn't apologize for that. And he thinks that he's going to create this wonderful world, right? You're gonna take care of all the problems in the world through science and industry and the exploitation of nature. So he thinks this is perfectly consistent with religion. Science tells us the power of God and how to exploit it. Religion tells us be nice to your neighbor, don't be greedy, right? Don't sin. And then now you're gonna have all these tools based on science and industry to actually help each other out. Um, and the method is you look at the facts and you draw an inference, right? So that's that was the original idea. We still have science as designed to exploit nature, even when we know that uh, we're destroying nature and we're so, but people are still looking away or seeing things differently, or they still think technology will get us out of this, or they still think somehow it's gonna be okay. So people's habits are corrupting their ability just to look at what's in front of their face. 
And Bacon did not anticipate that. He didn't think. Um, so there were thinkers at the time who knew eventually we'd have too many people, but it but the scientists would tell people you have to have fewer children in order for everyone to have enough. And everyone would agree with what the scientists said because they know the source of all this wonderful way of life is science and industry. And so they, they would be the new rulers, would be people who follow science. Like they, they thought political leaders wouldn't be able to get anywhere unless they explain it through science. And oh boy, he was wrong, right? They thought that this would be the end of religious leaders referring to God because people would be smart enough and they'd know, you know, no, no, science is what gives us a good life. I don't wanna hear about religion. That's a tool. Um, yeah, that's what he thought. Then um, Francis Bacon, uh, set up a paradigm for doing science. We test the hypotheses. So think about how many classes you have, how many you've had in the past, where this is the method you use. Think about whether you're also taught to use this method within the context of ecology and environmental destruction, or if you're taught that in a vacuum, right? Or without any sort of values, you know, any sort of context, or if you're taught it with the, the hope that someday you'll be able to create another kind of genetically modified whatever, or right, you'll be able to invent some other way of exploiting nature, exploiting the human genome and changing things around or, you know, curing a disease, but the cause of the disease is all the crap we put in the air and the water. So what sort of worldview underlies your scientific education? That's what I want you to think about. Um, let's see. Uh, some scientists are atheists, right? Some scientists are agnostics. Some are anti-religion. Some also believe in God, but they understand God in a lot of ways. Um, some think of God as consistent with reason. Some think of God as like Bacon, that's morals, science is facts. Um, let's see, so, so there's nothing inherent in science itself that forces people into one certain worldview. That's what I want to impress on you. And then when your teachers teach you science, do they think they have no values? Or do they think there is a worldview there? Or do they, um, well, let's see. Do they think they have no values, but they really do have values, right? Um, Okay, then the new social science, right? Um, what about utilitarianism was all about, remember John Stuart Mill molding people so that they would all take pleasure in the higher pleasures? That was gonna be the project for the social scientists. Um, all right, they look at the human psyche Remember, John Locke thought the psyche was a blank slate. John Stuart Mill, utilitarians, it's all blank. Um, and we're going to develop all the social science and create these environments, control human behavior, and everybody's going to be happy, OK? Mold people so they have empathy. Um, they thought they could change human nature permanently by getting rid of these vices. Um, there wasn't any way to prove that, right? It was just a big experiment. And they were convinced that, that the worldview of the religions, the seven deadly sins, greed, pride, sloth, all of those sins 
were the result of the social construction of this gap between the classes. And so when you have that gap, it just feeds greed, it feeds pride, it feeds sloth, laziness on the part of the poor because they don't gain anything when they work. So they don't work any more than they have to. Um, lust, because the people on top just um, have license to pursue uh, sex, you know, to be unfaithful. Anyway, so that they thought that as long as you have this class issues, you have these vices. But when we get rid of that, we're gonna get rid of those vices. And that Karl Marx also thought it was a blank slate. He just thought you had to change the economic system, but once you do, everybody's gonna be happy, right? Karl Marx thought that um, if everyone just has enough of what they need and they can trade jobs and they, that there won't be any problems anymore. And he was in favor of exploiting nature to, to improve the standard of human life and all that. So when Karl Marx you know, assumes a proletariat revolution will lead to utopia, he's, he's acting as, a, as an enlightenment thinker, right? You can't criticize him as being utopian because the capitalists were utopian also. And the utilitarians, they were all very utopian, okay? Um, they all believe human beings could be molded and that they would be molded. Um, okay, the doctrine of human rights that started out with a blank slate and then he created this, this idea of rights, right? God gave us the earth. Um, human beings are born free and equal. Okay, so he gives you this whole argument reasoning and he creates this image of everybody working hard and giving each other as much freedom as possible and becoming prosperous and not harming each other. And if somebody's naughty and harms you, then the police will come in. But, you know, as soon as possible, give, give people as much freedom. Um, you have a right to punish, you have a right to protect yourself, all that wonderful stuff. And then Karl Marx says, no, nah, this is an ideology. All this idea of rights is just about property rights, free trade, freedom to get as wealthy as I want, and then have the government protect me from anybody who tries to take my stuff, right? So Karl Marx says, this is the epitome of the capitalist dream point of view. <laughs> Um, let's see, applying human rights today, all right? So the way it applies today is, um, anyway, you can go through that. Um, do people think like this, freedom of religion? Is this really the way it is? Or is it just covering up what's really going on? Uh, what goes on in the in the U.S.? Is it really about rights or is it really about money? And Marx criticizes Locke because he thinks it's about money and then Locke and Marx respond. What about the United Nations? Is the United Nations really interested in cultivating the capabilities of people all over the world or some people in developing countries think, no, they're really interested in Western control of the developing countries. Um, you could say that the United Nations uses this ideology of rights in order to discourage people from being taken in by China, right? So in this battle between you know, America and Europe over here and China over here, people might think the United Nations is really a tool of the West, right? And do developing countries benefit from either one of these, right? Or they just get exploited in the name of one thing or another thing, either a Chinese ideology or a Western ideology, right? And the Chinese will say things like, 
well, we actually do care about people and we do have a much uh, stronger middle class and we, we don't have as big a gap between the rich and the poor. America is really unjust, not us. So why don't you go with us? <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. So neoliberalism is keep the government out, keep taxes. So I, I just think um, students in developing countries would, I hope they feel like they have skin in the game, like their countries are affected by this war and it's not just an economic war, it's a war of words too, you know? Culture plays a big role in whether, how people react to that kind of economic stuff going on. If they accept it, if they promote it, if they champion it, or if they're suspicious of it, or if they just reject it. So their attitude toward it has to be based on something other than what's actually going itself. It has to be connected to some worldview, some idea about what's really going on, right? Um, and so I'm gonna mention this and I'm gonna give you another 10 minute break in just uh, five minutes or so. But this is, you don't have to read all of this. I gave you only two pages to read, but you might be interested right and you might want to include this in your paper your next your paper coming up or in your final paper or you might want to do some kind of research paper that might want to use a quote from this but anyway so amarta zen is the one who started the capabilities approach the un and he read adam smith and he he writes about how in america People use Adam Smith to justify no government intervention, right? A free market. That is not what Adam Smith was saying, right? He was very worried about greed. And so Amartya Zen is saying, this is a really terrible interpretation. And it's really just using Adam Smith for your own purposes. And so I think that's interesting. And if you wanted to read just the little paragraphs that I marked to get the cheat sheet um, that, and he's talking about global reach, the global reach of his moral and political reasoning. Um, anyway, so, so that is a tool in the toolbox of corrupt uh, political leaders around the world. They can pull out Adam Smith's free market, blah, blah, invisible hand. And then you can at least know that, no, no, this is not what Adam Smith meant. And he was very worried about this. Here's something else that um, might be of interest. It's just about America and how we, you know, our economy, how it is that economics is being taught in America and it's being taught in a way that promotes greed and minimal government. And so basically Americans are getting brainwashed into this pro-capitalist point of view that, that is not producing a middle class. That's where John Locke in his day, he thought it was clear to him that minimal government, especially in America, would lead to people working hard, you work and you get a higher standard of living, unlike Europe. So people be highly motivated to work hard. And that's how you would get a middle class because he didn't want a strong government because that's what they had over in Europe and that prevented people from moving up the economic ladder. But Locke was worried about a middle class. And nowadays in America, the, the minimal government leads to a shrinking middle class for lots of reasons because of the different bases, right? It's not agricultural anymore. It's industrial, it's technological and you need public education. Like um, Shazneen was saying, education now has become this huge tool because in order to get a good job, you have to get a good education, which usually means expensive. And I do want, again, to impress on you, 
AUW is a very unique place because women are getting to go to get a good education just because they pulled themselves up, right? Their own effort, their own natural ability. And so it's a very special place. So I hope you all appreciate each other and the kind of dialogues that you can get into. It's not like universities where you have to have money to um, get in there. And so now you've got a little cohort of rich people just talking to each other. And um, AUW is designed as a place to try and prevent that money sticks to money syndrome that we're, we're in what's called late stage capitalism. It just gets worse and worse and worse. Um, so that's what um, uh, it talks about edu uh, economic education in the US. And then you can um, think about, well, what is your economic education um, like? And then this one is about, uh, again, the, all the misunderstanding and the false beliefs in the US that led to the economic collapse, which I don't know how much it affected your countries. Here's another one where economics encourages people who are sociopaths, right? It attracts people who do not care about other people. Again, that Adam Smith said, you must raise children to care about other people, right? John Locke, you must blah, blah. They understood greed is bad. They understood empathy is necessary. Generosity is necessary. They agreed with Aristotle, but that's not what's happened. What's happened is the opposite. Uh, pathological, people are mentally sick and they're rewarded for it. Um, okay, and this is a further, another article related to that. But the thing that I wanted you to write for your sake was these students from 19 countries are recognizing the way that the discipline of economics is encouraging greed and ignorance about climate change. And so I think you would be interested in this article. And um, that's why I put it in there. And then there's the cult of selfishness is killing America. But, and you don't have to read this. But you might want to read it in the sense, is it also killing your country or not, right? Are we just giving you a model that too many people in your countries are aspiring to um, or what, right? That's up to you. But I do hope you read this, this one article um, and that's not very many pages. Okay, so why don't you take a 10 minute break and then we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about the next section of the class, but I don't want you to be writing about religion much. I want you to focus on the Western right, science and industry, the legacy of those ideas and those techniques and the exploitation of nature and the belief that you could mold people to be good if you get the enough research and enough good behavior modification techniques. Okay, all right. Um, in our final paper, Professor. Yeah, uh, go sorry, ahead. Everybody I'm else can take a break. Paper. Right, everybody else can take a break if they want and I can, I'll sit here and take some questions. Go ahead. Who was talking to me? Oh yes, Professor, me. Uh, I was uh, like uh, the last um, point you told like about the science, we have to write about the science and the legacy. So is it for the next paper for 11th? Yes, yep. Just oh, okay. what we've covered so far. And then in your final paper, it's all up to you if you want to include that. Some students in their final paper talked quite a bit about their religious background. Um, so you don't have to talk about, well, I just, my main thing is you talk about what matters to you that you will put in, you know, that you'll remember because you connect it with your life. 
Um, but this first paper just has to be, I think you just need to know this centuries long legacy. And, you know, it something is going to have to give, but this is very powerful at the moment. And that's, it explains why the data about environmental destruction is so obvious, and yet we are not doing anything about it. This is the explanation for why, and I do think you need to know that. So. Thank you, Professor. Yep. All right, guys, I'm going to leave, so everyone take a break. I have five after, so it would be 13 minutes after we'll get back together. Okay. Can I pause it? So the next section of the class is about religious belief. Um, is it, and each of you has to decide, you know, are you going to be an atheist, humanist, you're going to be agnostic, you're going to be whatever. Um, what sort of environmental ethic do you want to have moving forward? So the first uh, reading, and I have three readings, um, in the post for today. So I, you know, I send this post, but most of the assignment is on the documents that were in the previous post. I hope you figured all this out. And these are the ones that we're going to explore um, right now for less than an hour. And then you need to read them and um, come prepared next time. Again, I have the page numbers and it's not that many pages total. 10 or 12, something like that. So first, I don't know how many of you are either Jewish, Christian, or, or Muslim, but even if you're not, what you should do is read the Genesis story and then think about, I mean, I'm glad that I have some students that are Buddhist or Hindu because it should dawn on them that this is a really different point of view. Um, and also, Aristotle did not have a personal God, and St. Thomas Aquinas co-opted him, you know, brought it into Christianity, but his idea of God was just a force that in the universe, it wasn't anything, any of us, any Jew, the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Quran has nothing to do with, with that historically embedded God. Um, so the, the, there's another important point, which is the way you translate some of these words. And um, what does it mean? So the creation took place in seven days. And um, then um, God created Adam and told him not to eat from the tree and Adam ate from the tree. Of course, it was all Eve's fault. You got to remember that. Uh, women are the cause of all evil. I Again, I have lots of students that are told that, which I think is sad. But anyway, when God says to Adam, you know, you, he gives Adam the creatures and tells them to name the creatures and so the idea, some people translate that, that they're given by God this mandate to master the earth, right? To control the earth. Um, and uh, so Lynn White talks about that. And that's what I'll turn to now. Um, but there's other ways to translate the particular Hebrew word. So the scholars go at, go at it, like what does the Bible really mean? Um, but apart from that, how has it been used? So that's another big problem, is that perhaps the original text is being misread, but the historical legacy, right, what we have to live with 
is a certain very widely agreed upon uh, application and interpretation, whether it's fair or not. Um, all right. So Lynn White. Oh, okay. He, okay, I'm not having you read the first page or the second page. You can if you like. I mean, it's all related and it's all relevant. Um, and then the medieval view, that's uh, St. Thomas, uh, united reason and faith, but, okay, oh, geez, okay, oh, so the medieval view, so I want you to read page 18, the bottom here, the victory, right here, the victory of Christianity over paganism was the greatest psychic revolution in the history of our culture. All right, so think about that. Under paganism, we are part of the universe. Under Aristotle, our mind evolved in relationship to the universe, the natural world, and its natural object is to understand the ecosystem it is not at all to exploit it, Aristotle's model. If you remember Francis Bacon completely disagrees with Aristotle. He, Aristotle's works was called the Organon and Bacon's work is called the new Organon. And I didn't lecture a lot about that, but uh, point after point, he undermines, destroys, disrupts, disagrees with, tries to throw away the logic of Aristotle, the view of God of Aristotle. So Aristotle's God is the foundation of reality. And so to understand reality is to understand God. But Bacon says, no, no. Nature is just shows you God's power, it doesn't lead you to God. It just shows you God had the power to create that. And then the Bible shows you God's will, right? But um, he rejects any kind of inference that Aristotle makes. And so over and over, he's completely rejecting paganism, any of any kind of paganism. Um, and it was a great psychic revolution. So you can think about um, how's your psyche, right? Does your psyche naturally bond with the natural world, right? You just do it without thinking about it. This is the way your family lives or this is whatever. Or do you just naturally turn on your phone? You're just focused on stuff that's sensuous, immediate, uh, and detached from the natural world. And so when people started getting cell phones, it was just one more layer of detachment. So, you know, I, I used to walk around the lake in Arkansas, and you couldn't even talk to anybody, right? Because they have their earbuds in. And so they just completely live in their own silo, right? Their own world where whatever, they hear what they want about anything, music, whatever, it's not just politics. They just completely decide what they want to know or be stimulated, right? So on the one hand, this is like, the ultimate happiness is I can stimulate myself and believe, think, feel, be exposed to exactly what I want, nothing more, nothing less, and be totally preoccupied with myself as long as I don't hurt anybody else. And it's right. <laughs> Just like actually, so this goes back to, to Immanuel Kant, right? I, I have this a priori reason completely detached from nature and I just live in that world. For Kant, it was this system of scientific laws 
And for the average cell phone user, it's just the system of, it's usually not a system. It's just this stream of consciousness, whatever I happen to feel or want or think or want to be convinced of or whatever. Um, okay, so from now on, when we read these articles, they will often refer back to some of the material that we've read. So for example, um, our daily habits are dominated by a faith in perpetual progress. Okay, again, he's referring to Americans. So it'd be interesting to me if you think people in your country basically agree with that. Do, you, do people have this faith in progress? Do they have this faith tech technology will solve the problems. Um, and so, and what he's pointing out is that was rooted in the Judeo-Christian view of a beginning, middle, and end to history. God acts in history and there will be an end, an end times. That's not what the Greeks thought, right? The Greeks didn't thought there was, think there was necessarily perpetual progress. So, um, the fact that communists share that same view, and that's what I tried to point out to you, was that even though at a certain level, it looks like capitalists and communists are totally opposed, they have a lot of the same beliefs. Exploiting nature is good. Things are going to get better and better. Molding people is possible. Utopia is possible. Um, so... So he's, he's showing that communism, Marx, was just an extension of this cultural tradition. And another thing that's interesting is Islam is similar, right? So again, there tends, there's this on the surface animosity between Christianity, Jews, and Muslims. But underneath that, they share a whole lot of similar worldviews. Uh, worldview and compared to Hindus or Buddhists or secular humanists or animists or things like that, they're more alike, like each other than different. Um, uh, okay. Aristotle, okay. All right. So Aristotle denied the world had a beginning. It just went from potential to actual. But Christianity has this story of creation and then man named all the animals, thus establishing his dominance over them. God planned all of this explicitly for humans benefit and rule, right? No item in the physical creation has any purpose except to serve man's purposes. That's the way he interprets ge the Genesis story. Although people's bodies made of clay, they are made in God's image. They're special, right? And God has a special mission for them. Christianity is the most anthropocentric religion in the world, okay? Which is it's human-centered. Um, Adam is the arc incarnate Christ. Um, human beings share God's transcendence of nature. Now, here's the other point I wanted to make is that there's a dualism, right? Though that goes back to Kant. Remember Kant said he, that rational nature is of infinite worth. It's completely different than the rest of the natural world. And that's why we have no duties to animals, right? Okay, so when whenever they talk about dualism, you, you link that to Christian dualism. Human beings are different, they're special, and they can use the natural world. And you also link it to Kant's. So it's one, one dualistic position is based on ultimately faith. The other one is based on reason enlightenment reason. Okay, so between the two of them, the union of reason and faith would justify a whole lot 
of exploitation of nature for human well being. Um, okay, and then he contrasts that. Um, in antiquity, every tree, every stream had a guardian spirit. Um, and so that was what ancient paganism uh, was. By destroying paganist, pagan animism, Christianity made it possible to exploit nature in a mood of indifference to the feelings of natural objects. So that's what, that's what Kant legitimized. And he's saying that's what Christianity legitimized. So that's all you have to read there. And then you need to read an alternative Christian view. And so his argument is that our science and technology have grown out of Christian attitudes toward our relation to nature, which are almost universally held not only by Christians and neo-Christians, but even people consider themselves post-Christians. So he thinks, you know, people have this attitude without thinking about it. And if you think, I don't know how many of you think about how much plastic you use, or think about how much water you use, or think about, you know, um, the way your lifestyle exploits nature. Now, most of you have a way, way lower fossil fuel uh, footprint than I do. And I think about the stuff, but my fossil fuel footprint is still more just because the culture um, demands it. You, can, you can't function except um, by using a lot of fossil fuels. So, um, all right. What we do about our ecology depends on our ideas. So this is, as a philosopher, I am saying that ideas matter. They matter to you when you decide how to live, but they also matter in the sense that political leaders can use them to either move people in the direction of sustainability or move them away. And um, they're powerful, right? They're, what people talk about informally, the way people informally talk to each other and form a certain way of making sense of the world. That's, that has incredible power. Um, so he's advocating, this is interesting, St. Francis, okay? And, you know, we have Pope Francis. Pope Francis knows that he is, his name was, uh, came from St. Francis. And he knows that St. Francis has a prayer for all the animals. St. Francis was the closest thing to paganism that Christianity ever had. So before Francis was Pope, you know, I would just teach this as, um, this is true, St. Francis was a guy and, and uh, Lynn White is advocating it, but it's really interesting that Pope Francis is really focused on sustainability and he has conferences on it, right? But in his mind, he really wants that branch of Christianity started by Francis to take over, right, to be the dominant one. And he knows what he's up against because he knows this whole intellectual and cultural background. Um, so Francis, okay, Francis did have a doctrine of the animal soul, but it got squelched <laughs> um, because the, you know, the powerful Catholics Francis was not powerful. He was a voice in the wilderness, right? A critic. Um, the present disruption of the global economic um, environment is the product of a dynamic technology and science originated in the West, um, which St. Francis was rebelling against. And his final word here is that, whoops, sorry. Um, 
the greatest spiritual revolution in revolutionary in history, St. Francis proposed an alternative Christian view. And we, we really need, since the root of our trouble is so largely religious, the remedy must also be religious, whether we call it that or not. So that's, I, that's what I want you to think about from that article. Um, the next article, whoops, is argues basically that you shouldn't blame Christianity. The real causes are just technology, science, technology, um, the way the whole culture, the economic foundation of the culture. So I have you, I assigned you just to read um, page uh, 22 to 24. So it's the first three pages and then the last page. So, so he is um, talking about all the different social institutions, whole list. So this gives you an idea of how everything in culture works together. And then um, the Protestant work ethic. This is uh, John Locke. John Locke was Protestant um, or Church of England, but he wasn't Catholic. And he had his own view of God, which was not Aristotelian. And that view of God and science and social science, that's the Protestant work ethic. And that was the one that really uh, was the real driver of exploitation of nature. And other Catholics sort of got on board with it. But Pope Francis knows that his tradition is much more compatible with sustainability than the Protestant one. And um, so he's stepping up, right? He's stepping up and speaking out, which is really good <laughs> for him. But you do need to know that he knows where he stands in terms of intellectual and cultural history and context. Um, yeah, capitalism also, this idea of determinism that um, God, God has already decided if you're saved or damned, but your behavior will sort of indicate that. And that combined with Locke's view of the power of social sciences and sort of determinism based on science is pretty powerful. Um, let's see. Okay, so he refers to Lynn White's article, blah, blah. And, and his claim is that that's too simplistic, okay? Just to blame Christianity is too simplistic. So I, I do want you to give a sense that, okay, here's Lynn White's argument. What do you think of that? Well, here's Moncrief. He himself is giving his own critique. And so you can decide, what do I think of Moncrief's critique? Um, okay. The primary conditioner, and what he's arguing, the primary conditioner behavior toward the environment is more than just religion, right? And you could tell that because people who are not Christian also exploited the natural world, right? It's not as if you had to be Christian to do that. So Christianity could not be the only cause. And then he's saying, right, there is this, there exists in all cultures, um, egocentric tendencies, and a hierarchy of positions and values. So there's status, right? People want money to survive and they want status. And um, just if you're just talking about survival needs, that I don't think you should call that evil, right? And because we have 7 billion people, if every one of them got some basic needs met, we would destroy the environment. So, you know, it's not just selfishness. The particular imbalance we have in our economic system, that 
the greed that's driving it is causing a lot more harm and it's preventing us from changing. But there is a level at which many of you um, know that there's people who basically just want to eat and um, they have to meet that need the way their culture, they, you know, the options that the powers that be give them. And if it means cutting down a tree, there isn't a lot they can do about it unless they want to starve. But the real problem is this egocentric tendency and the desire for status and the desire to be richer than everybody else. Um, so that's universal. That's not just um, because of Christianity, right? It's not Christianity's fault. That's human nature. So I do want you to read this section that what happened in the West was this combination of democracy, freedom and equality, and we talked about that, in terms of John Locke and Bentham. We didn't talk about it in the French Revolution, but the idea of rights in the French Revolution is the same idea as Locke and as the US. Um, so his claim here is that he links the rise of democracies with the rise of science and technology there was more social mobility, people could go up in status. And when they did that, there was a lot of technological innovation naturally, right? Because people um, use their imaginations and they had the freedom to go ahead and create new things, create new products. You get the fruit of your labor. Um, and that's where, that's why the US was way ahead of other countries. Even when I was born in the 50s, John Kennedy advocated pro-science and everybody was on board, you know, science is our salvation. God wants us to do this. We're gonna be the leaders in progress and this is God's will, blah, blah. So that was generally what happened. Um, and when that happened, uh, the increased wealth um, yeah, led to a more equitable distribution, the formation of a middle class. So everybody's excited about that. So I'm wondering if this happened in your countries. That's what I'm curious about, right? Was there this revolution and you changed from a king or a nobility to democracy? supposedly, right, free elections. Did that happen simultaneously? At the same time, there was more social mobility and that there was more technological innovation. I'm curious, right? It's probably not as radical as it was in the US, but it might actually be true, right? That people who previously could not start a business, all of a sudden they can start businesses they can get successful. Um, the markets are free markets. The rich don't get to control the markets or tax things to make it impossible for anybody but them to succeed. And so there is this opening up to a broader number of people to participate in the economic system. Well, then there's more demand, right? Um, and there's more waste products. So all of this builds up. So you only have to read up to here, this section, uh, because then he describes America in particular. And if, if you're interested in knowing why America is the only country that reject, has rejected the Coyota protocol, right? It's been the worst on um, environmental protections this this will help you understand that because we have traditionally depended so much on exploiting nature. And then I would like you to read the conclusion um, because the conclusion just gives you this map in your head of all the different aspects of any culture, including your own. Um, and then how has it changed 
when did it have this leap forward right into capitalism, urbanization, environmental degradation? So is this happening in your countries? Um, what are the similarities and differences? And where do you think it's headed, right? Um, let's see. All right, so that's that article. And then the last one, I only, I have you reading um, two and a half pages. So again, not very much, but page, okay, page 30, um, the top of the second column. So, okay, here. The unique contribution of a Christian ecology, right? So what he is worried about is another thing that is getting to be really big in the world right now, which is um, environmental justice. Like as we start to acknowledge that the environment is a problem, are the rich going to be able to run away and secure their, their own well being? And the poor are just going to really get hit, hammered and maybe even die off, right? So, what he's saying is that the co contribution of Christian is that it's not just sustainability, but we also have to be committed to social justice, right? Because love God, love your neighbor as yourself. So you can respect the environment without treating people like um, pawns, right? Without deciding, well, I guess 3 billion people are going to have to die so that the other few billion can live, right? I mean, it, it can get pretty gory if, if um, people start speculating. And I'm going to have you reading some articles where it really is environmental fascism. So they are arguing for environmental fascism because um, you need to know that there are people who are really committed to that. But this, this guy says, the one thing Christianity offers and not just Christianity, right? But why would we want to keep Christianity as the foundation for our environmental uh, ethics, it would be because it also has a social justice component. So that was that was his view. And then he quotes from the Bible. So those of you who have the Old Testament, right, the Muslims, uh, you would be, you know, this is a, uh, has some religious authority to you also, and you can look at those quotes. We are going to read an article about Islam. And it will quote from the Quran, but um, the Old Testament is legit, I think, um, to Muslims. Um, let's see. The next is, next point is um, the prophets. Uh, so he's quoting, yeah, this is all biblical references to justify a Christian sustainability. And here's a major issue about the Genesis story. So God bestows the earth, you know, he gives the earth to humanity, but that doesn't mean they have absolute control because his main point is that no one generation possesses the earth and the earth was made to endure and was given for all future generations. And so the covenant between God and human beings is forever. And you have to pass on the earth to the next generation, right? There's no way you could, you could undermine it for the next generation. He's saying the Bible would never advocate that. Um, its heritage is something of enduring value designed to benefit all future generations, the world, right? Um, P. 
people are duty bound, right? Religious people, Christians and Jews to conserve the resources and pass them on to future generations. Each generation exists only as a sojourner or pilgrim. Um, we have to put limits on ourselves, on our use of our resources. Um, the combined emphasis on God's ownership, our trusteeship and the limits of life call for an attitude of humility and care. So let me see. Um, I remember when I was in high school, um, my father, so my father was a minister and um, my future father-in-law was a philosophy teacher. And in 1968, I knew people who were huge into the environmental movement. They were biology teachers and um, they were pagans basically, but, and my uh, father-in-law was a Quaker, but he started an environmental ethics program at the college in 1968. I mean, everybody knew about this stuff. It wasn't, I didn't live in a, I didn't live in the New York or California where all the elites live. I live in the middle, Midwest, you know, a bunch of farmers fly over country, <laughs> but uh, I knew this and my father when I was eight years old he said to me you're gonna have to work out your own theology so that's why I'm telling my students to work out their own positions is because I was told that at age eight <laughs> so uh, that's I do think I, I must have scared me quite a bit because I think I did start to think about it for fear that oh my gosh I don't want to get this wrong uh, but I remember in, in high school, my first premise was that there's no way God would want us to destroy the earth, right? That is the ultimate evil. And if there is a hell, which, you know, I don't, I don't base my behavior on that. But if there is a hell, boy, people are going to roast on slow boil forever if they if they do not pass on the legacy of the earth to the next generation. I just thought that was the ultimate sin, right? And I have a lot of students who, um, who really don't pay attention to environmental destruction. And so I used to say in class, I can't think of anything more arrogant than to put God on a timeline and tell God, gee, God, I guess you decided to destroy the world, but I believe in you and I love Jesus. So I know I'm going to heaven. And I also get to drive my gas guzzling car and live in my fossil fuel heavy house. That's just great, God, what a deal. <laughs> and I just think a lot of my students, they just, they have cognitive dissociation, like they don't want to give up their car, their house, their gas guzzling life, but they want to believe in Jesus and go to heaven. And they don't want to think about, is my treatment of the environment anything to do with God? With And I it's just, when I was in ninth grade, I would say it has everything to do with it. Like this is principle number one. <laughs> And so it was hard, but I think that, you know, you all have to decide for yourselves what you think and whether you base it on um, some kind of, let's see, I think that's all, what did I give you to read? Uh, what your priorities are, what your worldview is and how important, um, Page 20, what did I say? Sorry, got my papers mixed up. I don't know. Anyway, that's enough. So that's his main view, right? It's a covenant relationship and you can't, you cannot undermine the earth. If you hand on a worse 
earth, right? If you uh, deteriorate the creation, <laughs> you're in deep trouble with God, if there is a God, right? Um, so, so that's my, that's, that's pretty much it. Are there any questions now about um, the process of the class? You know about the posts. There's a paper due. It's a thousand words or more. It's three sources. They can all be from the class. It's your thesis statement about the legacy of the, of the Western scientific revolution technology. Um, you, you are supposed to talk to me about your thesis and come with an idea and a plan, an outline, and then we'll talk about it. But I will also talk to you about your posts because I need to touch base with all of you um, I mean, there's a couple students that are doing fine, but I need to get contact with people. Um, I am, I'm not going to lower the requirements for the class, you know, to give you a week and a half's work of 15 pages of reading. I'm not going to water it down more than that. Um, and then I don't know how much time people are taking because very few people write that in their posts, but the ones that do, it's, it's fine, you know, three and a half to four hours. I'm not going to give you less than that because that's an hour and a quarter per hour of class. And it's supposed to be two hours per hour of class. So I don't mind, you know, cutting back but I'm not going to cut back any more than that. Um, partly because I'm not doing you a favor. All I'm doing is flattering you into believing that, you know, you can do stuff that maybe you can't do. Um, so I've got to get you, I've got, you know, you're going to have my class on your transcript. I want to think that Having taken my class has gotten you up a notch. So it's a valuable transcript. If you have, you know, an AUW degree and you go out and get a job or go to um, grad school and people help you with your applications and they rewrite them for you, whatever, and you get there and you have to write something and you can't write English, uh, AUW is in trouble, you're in trouble, uh, everybody's in trouble. So the other thing is for you to learn how to think synthetically. That's what my class is about. I think a lot of, um, um, I think that's, that's what causes some people to stand out from others is that a lot of your classes, you just learn the material, you score high in the test. But what they're looking for in an employee, I think, or in a graduate student is somebody that can start putting the pieces together and see how the parts fit the whole. So that's my philosophy and my reasons behind what I'm asking you to do. Um, I have office hours the next three days from, let's see, nine to 11 a.m. Bangladesh time. So it's an hour later than we usually start the class. Uh, I might open up the office hours uh, earlier, but you know I have a dance recital to go to on, on what's my Thursday, right? Your Friday morning and then we going out to eat and things like that. So if people you know, if people need me to be available at another time, just email me. Um, as I've said, I don't want this course to cause you stress, but a lot of people are way behind. And if that causes you stress, I don't think that's my fault, right? I'm not going to water it down just so you don't have stress, right? Um, I just 
I have to be professional. Um, and that's it, but I will work with you definitely. I know you have a lot of obstacles and I, but in terms of the final requirements and grades and stuff, I can't water that down. All right, any other questions? No, Professor, at this moment. <laughs> okay, because we can obviously, we can quit 10 minutes early if you want to. Um, I, but I will sit here and wait and people can leave or they can stay. Professor, you have officials from tomorrow, like next three days, right? The next, the next three days, yeah. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Professor. I'll see you, inshallah. Uh, professor, um, is there any kind of structural uh, like rules for the paper, uh, like according, like the for the cite citations, reference, and oh, okay. So, so if yeah, if it is uh, material from the class, you just cite, you know, Google Classroom the date and the name of the attachment. So I'm, I'm gonna give you a break on that. But if the source outside of the class, then you have to do a standard bibliographic. Um, and are we free to choose like how many sources we want to use? Of course, it's just at least three, but you can always have more. Okay. And they can be outside. I mean, I love to learn things that I don't know, that the students know. So, right, you have something from your country that's really relevant. I would love that <laughs> because I learn and also because I know that you're attaching it to your life and so you'll remember it. So, so I like it, it when you do that. I just am not requiring that because that's a lot more work. Yeah, thank you, Professor. Of course. Have a good day. Yeah, you too. Anybody else? Oh, I was just about to have like a meeting with you to discuss my plan for the paper. Okay. Because honestly, I totally forgot about the paper. I only realized I kept telling myself that there's a paper due July 1st on the research paper, but I totally forgot about this paper. I only remembered when you mentioned about it this morning. Well, I should have. I, I'm sure I should have reminded you, but I. On the other hand, you know, you have a syllabus and you can put it yeah. in the calendar, but that's okay. I, I know. That's okay, Rossi. So I'm sure you'll have time to do it. It's not a huge task or anything. Um, so what what are you thinking? I was, I wanna answer the first question, your guided question of how does Western Enlightenment called Bodhi, they put a huge amount of tax on even human, like they have human tax and stuff, and how that is affecting human lives. And during that period, Cambodia lost a lot of forests because they were cutting down um, for uh, trees for lumber. And so that, and I also want to, one more section to talk about um, Africa and how they are going into African soil and taking minerals and yeah, basically exploiting the resources. I, I just need to do a bit more research into finding the relation on how these Western colonization are impacting res natural resources there and how the human lives there were becoming worse and worse. Yeah, actually, we do we do read at least one article on that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we do touch on it. 
But definitely, if you want to go further into it, yeah, Africa has so many resources and yet they're so poor, right? And it's because of the way they're getting abused. Yeah. And I feel like Cambodia also, Cambodia, I remember that back in 2012, the government mentioned about mining some type of minerals from here or mining oil or something, I forgot, but it happened in Tunlisap Lake, which is near where I lived, but that never happened. Like the mining for the resources for Cambodia to use never happened. And then now China is coming in and they are going back into that same land and saying that they're mining and I'm like I've heard this news that Cambodia is doing it but then now it's going back to like western countries coming in to do it and so it's the same thing as what is happening in Africa where the native countries don't get a chance to use that resources to help them but rather have another country leech off that um, resources from them. Yep. Um, it started out with the Western ideology, right? And now I think the Chinese have a different set of categories to justify it. <laughs> I think they actually- like, They are like buying in nations. I remember last year I was in this class. My teacher told me that China was buying in a country in Europe. Um, it's a tiny country. Like they were trying to provide funds, like loans to build la like a highway across the country so that they can um, transport resources from one end of the nation to the other end. And since this country is in so much debt to China, China is slowly gaining control over it. So now this country is no longer an independent nation, but rather Really? a like a servant to China providing China with everything well that could easily happen to America I mean we're so in debt to China it's just sad um mm -hmm. I that isn't Luxembourg is it I I forgot I I know it's like a really tiny nation in uh, in Europe okay well Luxembourg is a tiny nation in the middle of Europe um I, I don't I think it's Luxembourg. I don't think so because that's a wealthy, that's generally been a pretty wealthy country, but I'm trying to think of one that it that's poor, you know. I don't know. Anyway, it doesn't surprise me. Um, I think America's only salvation from all this debt is to go green. And yet we have one political party that is absolutely not gonna do it because a very few fossil fuel billionaires have control of our system. It's, I read two 350 page books about the Koch brothers, these people, and they are just ruthless. They are absolutely ruthless. They don't care. It's incredible. Um, yeah, so, China, you know, has a lot to say about how rotten capitalism is and how their system is so much better because it distributes wealth better and they base their stuff on facts and they're going to go green. As in, I mean, the government will mandate going green, whereas our, our system just keeps so much infighting that we can't, can't do it. It's just terrible but we'll see what happens. Yeah. I just think it's better to be informed than to be ignorant. <laughs> it's like being ignorant, it becomes like a weapon that another person can use against you. Yeah, because then when you get desperate, you want to find someone to blame, you know? Yeah. And, and also it, when you're ignorant and when you don't know anything, then when someone tells you something or just put in a few sweet words, you believe them easily and then you turn your back against reality. Social media. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. So yeah, I, you have to have some way of staying informed, 
and being proud, you know, taking pleasure in the fact that you're informed without letting it get to you, right? Yes. Um, but I think it it's not a problem for me because I think the alternative is to be ignorant but happy. No, you know, that that's not going to work because sooner or later it'll catch up to you and uh, you won't be able to handle it. So I think it's possible to be perfectly happy about being informed, even though, you know, <laughs> it looks pretty grim, uh, but it's much better to know than not to know. Yeah. So, yeah, I've learned a lot about Cambodia from you and Ratana and stuff, and it's so interesting. Um, incredible. Anandita, are you there? She's the one I thought would get into animal rights, right? She's got these animals on her picture. So. I'll get going then, Dr. Beck. Thank you so much. Sure. Goodbye. Good. Yep, bye-bye. I guess so.